Hello and welcome to a new video on cryptography for everybody. Last week I was in Oxford on Histocrypt 2024 and it was a really great conference. We had very interesting talks, we were at Bletchley Park, we were able to have a look at the Turing bomb, at Colossus and on many other interesting things. And I gave a talk about our last research and today in this video I want to repeat this talk especially for the viewers of this channel. As you can see, the talk's name is Script Analysis of Hagelin M209 Cipher Machine with Artificial Neural Networks, a known plaintext attack. The research was performed by me and my colleagues, mainly by Vasily Mikhaev, then me and Bernard Esslinger, together with our Austrian colleagues Harald Lampesberger and Eckhard Hermann. I structured my talk into four different parts. First of all, I want to give you an introduction why machine learning is important also for historical cryptography. Then I will briefly introduce the Hagelin M209. We already had a video on this channel, but for those who don't know the machine, this is the introduction to it. Then I will briefly introduce our attack, which is based on machine learning. And finally, I will conclude this talk with a conclusion and future work. Why is it important to work with machine le learning for cryptanalysis? There were recently significant progress in machine learning for cryptanalysis. A few years ago, there were new attacks against modern ciphers. There was a paper by Aaron Gore in 2019 where he improved attacks on round-reduced spec 3264 using deep learning. And here, artificial neural networks helped him to perform cryptanalysis of reduced versions of the modern ciphers. And the really fascinating and interesting part here is that before his paper, we thought there's no way that machine learning can help to work with cryptanalysis. And he proved us wrong. And this was the initial spark also for our research. Then, a few years after that, we worked on classification of classical ciphers. We published two papers. First, a massive machine learning approach for classical cipher type detection using feature engineering. And then a second paper, detection of classical cipher types with feature learning approaches. And we performed this research together with our Austrian colleagues. And out of that, came ANSID, our neural cipher identifier. And with our solution, artificial neural networks help us to identify 56 different classical cipher types. And since the week I presented this paper or this talk here on Histocrypt, our neural cipher identifier ANSID is extended with five rotor encryption machines. And this research was performed by Mark Stamp and his colleagues. And you can have a look at NSID, our neural cipher identifier, on the Crypto webpage. After performing this research, we asked our question, can we break cipher machines also with machine learning? And our good friend and colleague, George Lesry, came up with an interesting idea. And we used this idea to create a new attack on the M209 cipher machine. What are cipher machines? Cipher machines are either mechanical or electrical encryption devices. They were state-of-the-art tools before ciphers were implemented on computers. So basically, during World War II, these machines were used. Some of them, for instance, the M209, were the prototypes of the modern screen ciphers we use today. And basically, they create a pseudo-random key stream, so these are these pseudo-random keystream generators are the main building block of such stream cipher machines like the M209. Here we have a comparison of Enigma and Hagelin M209. The Enigma is a very heavy machine. It weighs 12 kilograms, while the M209 only weighs 2.7 kilograms. The Enigma machine is electrical or electromechanical and the Hagelin M209 is purely mechanical. The Enigma machine is much larger compared to the very small Hagelin machine. We know that a 
total of 40,000 pieces of the Enigma were produced, while there were also 140,000 pieces of Hergelin M209 produced. The Enigma was in use between 1930 and 1945, and the Hergelin M209 was used between 1935 and 1970. The Enigma had a key space of 77 bit, and the Hergelin M209 had a much larger key space of 174 bit. Here's the introduction of the M209. The M209 consists of a set, set of six pin wheels. You can see these here on the right side. The wheels have a size of 26, 25, 23, 21, 19, and 17. These numbers are co-prime. And this allows the machine to have a very large period only after 26 multiplied 25 multiplied 23 and so on multiplied 17 rotations of all the wheels, the machine is in the same state again. Then the machine has a drum with 27 bars. You can see the drum here and the bars you can see here as lines. And then we have a so-called encoder mechanism here. This mechanism is used for encryption or decryption, so you can switch between encryption and decryption. To en encrypt one character, you have to set the machine to encryption mode. Then you have to select a plain text letter using the type wheel. This is this here. Then you have to turn the handle on the right side to rotate the drum, this one here. This rotates the drum, one complete revolution, and also all wheels then step one at the same time. And the ciphertext letter is finally printed on a paper tape that you can see here. So as I said, the drum consists of 27 bars and each of these bars have two movable lugs. You can see the lugs here. You have two lugs on each of these bars. And each lug may be set against one of the wheels. So you can see these lugs are set against uh, the wheels here. And no, sorry, these lugs are not set against the wheels, they are in the zero position. The one, two, three, four, five, and six positions, these are set against the wheel. And each wheel has a number of pins. And you can see the pins here. For instance, the Q here has a pin, the P here has a pin. And the pin can be in an effective or a non-effective state. Effective means the pin, you can, you can see the pin here, and non-effective means the pin is inside the wheel. And pins near the drum are in the so-called active positions. So pins that are directly, you cannot see that here, um, connected to the drum, they are in an active position. As I said, the drum makes a complete turnover. And then when a bar luck hits the effective wheel pin here, so this luck here hits a pin, in the active position, the displacement, it's a value, is incremented. And the total displacement, di, is the number of such shifted bars. So when these bars travel <laughs> um, to the wheels here, when they make a rotation, then a bar can shift to the left, and this increases the so-called displacement value. And as I said, all wheels rotate one step when you encrypt a character. Now let's see what is a displacement value. The, the machine generates a stream of pseudo-random displacement values di. For each of the characters that you encrypt, you get a new displacement value. And basically, this displacement value is then used to perform a Beaufort cipher, which is a Caesar cipher with an inverted alphabet. So when we think of our plain text letter as a number and our cipher text letter as a number, we have to compute this equation here. We compute 25 minus the number of the plain text letter plus the displacement value for that plain text letter and then we have to compute mod 26 and we get our cipher text letter and the pi is the index of the plain text character in the alphabet for instance a is 0 b is 1 and that is 25 and ci is the index of the the cipher text character then for example we have a displacement value of 4 we have a plain text character k, which is equal to 10. We compute then 25 minus k, which is 10, plus 4. We have to compute mod 26, and then the result is 19. And 19 is the letter T. 
So we basically have shifted the letter K one, two, three, four steps here to this position. And this then is the letter T. And this is a Beaufort cipher, a Caesar cipher with an inverted ciphertext alphabet. Now let's have a look at what a M209 key looks like. So we can set up all the LUCs here. So for the first bar here, we have the LUC set to 3, 6. For the second bar, we have set the LUCs to 0 and 6 and so on and so forth. For all 27 bars, we can set the LUCs. And then here we have the pins of the wheels. The first wheel, for instance, has a pin at A, a pin at B, C is not a pin set, D is a pin set and so on. So all the wheels or the pins of the wheels are also defined here. And this is just another representation of the lux here on the bars. We have bar one and we see with three six, we have a lux at position three and a lux at position six and so on. Then we have different key classes with the M209. The key has to be created using certain guidelines and these guidelines came, for instance, from the US Army. The key strength that then depends on two parameters, the so-called non-shared LUX. This is a number of LUX not involved in the LUX overlap positioned against the wheel, the pins of which are being recovered. And then we have the number of overlaps with other wheels. In general, we can say the less number of LUX are against the wheel, the harder it is to recover its pins. Now we can ask ourselves, what are non-shared LUX and what are overlaps? Let's have a look again at our key here. For instance, we have here four LUX with overlaps. This here is a LUX with overlap. The LUX uh, for bar four has a LUX set to five and a LUX set to one. This is a LUX overlap. And here we have the same with a LUX set to five and a LUX set to four. Here's the same LUX set to five, LUX set to two. This is an overlap. Here's a LUX set to five and here to two. So we have also an overlap. And then we have non-shared LUX. These are from 2020 to 27 here. These bars have only one LUX set, only the five here set. These are six non-shared LUX. Now let's have a look at our new attack. Our new attack is a known plain text scenario. That means that you know both the cipher text and the plain text. We have a pure artificial neural network approach. That means we give an, as an input the key stream of length n and the keys, key stream you can get by subtracting the plain text from the cipher text. Since we have a known plain text scenario, we can do this. We have a length of the key stream of 52. This is two times the uh, number of uh, the first wheel size. Then we have 104 and we have 200. The output of a network is only one peel. The output of a network is only one pin of a wheel. Then the key stream is a difference of plain text and cipher text characters. I already explained that you can just subtract each other and then you get the key stream. To recover all the pins of the machine, we trained not only one, but 131 artificial neural network models. And in simple words, the one pin per wheel problem. So we want to determine the position of or the setting of the one pin per wheel is a binary classification problem. That means that each of our neural networks answers the question, is it set for wheel X, the pin Y? And as an answer, we get yes or no. Now let's have a look at our artificial neural network. Our network, that you can also find here when you have a look at the source code is similar to the one used by Gore that I introduced you in the related work of this talk. Our network begins with pre-processing. That means division of each input value by 25. And this normalizes the input values between zero and one. This is a pre-processed step. Then we have a so-called first convolution layer. And the convolution layer is a layer that where you have not, you don't give the complete text to a complete input layer, but you have some kind of window and you shift that window over the text. Let's say our convolution layer is 20 and we have a text of 200. Then we have 
the window at position one, window at position two, and so on. And this is the input. Then we have so-called five res res residual blocks. These are two convolution layers. You can see these here. Then we have a dense layer of 512 neurons. Each input is connected with each other. That's a dense layer. And then we have a final output layer, which gives a prediction of a single pin. So we have only one or zero as an output. One means the pin is set. This is our yes. And zero means the pin is not set. This is our no. So the final network consists of a total of one plus five times two plus one plus one. So in total, 13 layers. Here you can see the accuracy of our networks. Here we tested our network with a key stream length of 52, here with 104, and here with 200. With 52, we have an average accuracy of 71%. And here you can see the distribution of the accuracy among all of our tests. With a double-sized key stream, you can see that the average accuracy increases to 88%. And then with a key stream length of 200, we already have an average accuracy of 96% to recover the wheel pins. And accuracy is defined as a proportion of correctly identified pins out of the total 26 pins of wheel one. N is the length of the key stream, which is also the displacement values. Here you can see a table for the most difficult case where N is equal to 25. And you can see here that the less number of non-shared lugs, this, are, uh, this is uh, um, the rows, the better is the accuracy. So we have non-shared lugs here. And when we have 30 non-shared lugs, we have an accuracy of 93%. And the overlaps increase the performance. So the overlaps are here the columns. And when you go to the right, you can see that the numbers also get larger. That means that the number of overlaps also increase the performance. The best case is we have 30 non-shared lugs, which is 93%. And the worst case is we have one non-shared luck, which is 51%. Yeah, and this is a conclusion and future work. Our research showed that artificial neural networks are able to successfully recover all pins of all wheels of M209 with an accuracy of 71% when n is equal to 52, with 88% when n is equal to 104, and with 96% when n is equal to 200. What is possible future work? Future work is to gain better accuracy for recovering pins with shorter n. Then future work could be to recover the bar lugs. Then future work could be to investigate ciphertext only attacks. So this was only a, a known plaintext attack. So a ciphertext only attack would be also very interesting. And then you could apply the same technique to other cipher machines. Yeah, so this is the end of this video and this was the end of my talk. If you're interested in the source code, you could scan this QR code to go on GitHub or you could scan this QR code to go to NSIP, our neural cipher identifier. So as I said, Thank you very much for your attention. See you in the next video.